Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's give the Lord some praise. So we're going to start this thing off with uh, Pastor Corey's and Shelby's uh, baby. Little, his name is Ty. I had no idea his name is Ty. I called him little Corey since birth. So I know his legal name was Ty. But anyway, little Corey pulled a uh, bowl of, out of the microwave, a bowl of ramen noodles over on him, and it burned his chest and his stomach and uh, the burns were pretty bad they're first and second degree uh, luckily not third so they did take him to the Shriners Shriners Hospital in Galveston everything's going fine but we do want to shower that family in your prayers like right now we want to lift them up okay so let's do that Lord in Jesus name Lord we ask right now that you let your spirit come into that hospital room Come into that family, God, and bring peace of all things, God, right now. We remove the turmoil that the enemy brings when these kind of things happen and the, the just the atmosphere of panic that he brings. God, we take authority over that. We remove that from their lives right now, God. And we ask that your spirit of peace, that a spirit of healing will come in and begin to move in that hospital room in Jesus' name. Say it with me, in Jesus' name, amen. Hope your fast is going well. Some of y'all don't look like you're fasting. I smell cheeseburgers on a couple of you. Just saying, maybe a little pizza on one of you. Um, we got one more day, one meal a day, and it's going well. We've had some real breakthrough in it. So it's worth, it was uh, not only good for my weight, which has not been affected at all, but it's good for my spirit. So, I, got it. I don't know. I'm eating more at one time now. I'm just trying to compensate for the next 24 hour run. It's kind of like, like one of those electric cars. I'm trying to charge the battery all the way up to full before I take off. Anyways, uh, so with that being said, I was not ready for tonight. Uh, but I'm ready for tonight. You know what I mean? Yeah. All right, so we're going to turn to the book of James, chapter 4. I'm missing Tommy Brown. I'm missing one sober house person, I believe. Oh, yeah, go tell him it's time to come inside. Teach you to regulate. By the way, we volunteered you to be on the prayer partner team. <laughs> It's going to be great. We, you're going to experience some great breakthroughs. As we did in a lot of ways, so we're we're hoping that the same happens for you. I'm going to read James chapter four. I'm going to read it to you from the King James. Then I'm going to read it to you to the Passion. The Passion is what's on the screen. I am going to read the New King James to you first. Uh, so you'll know where I'm at. There was uh, there's some old things I'm going to brush up on in this Bible study. I'm going to come back to this scripture, but I want we're going to read it first. And I want it to uh, since it's fast time. I want that to marinate, kind of like a big steak. <laughs> okay. All right, here we go. Where You can thank Dr. Tommy for this Bible study. He was the uh, made for TV movie based on a true story. James chapter 4, verse 1. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure? that war in your members. You lust and do not have. You murder and covenant 
and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Yeah. Adulterers and adulteress, do you, know, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Who, whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy? But he gives more grace. <clears throat> Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's one instruction. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That's yeah. two instructions. Yeah. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. That's three instructions. Wow. Lament and mourn and weep. That's four instructions. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. <laughs> Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Verse 17 says this. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Wow. Yeah. I'm going to read to you a little, a little more descriptive version. <clears throat> the Passion translates, which is what's up on the wall. Hit it, Jeffrey. Verse 1. Whence come wars and <clears throat> fightings among you? <clears throat> come they not hence, even of your pleasures that war in your members. Verse two, you lust and do not have. You kill and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war and you have not because you ask not. Listen to this, verse three. You ask not and receive not because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Ye adulterers know not that the friendship of the world is in enmity with God. And this is the same. Sorry, I lost my spot. Whosoever therefore would be a friend of the world, making himself an enemy of God, or think ye that the scripture speaketh in vain. Doth the spirit which he made to dwell in us long ago unto envy. But he that giveth grace, more grace, wherefore the scripture said, God resists the proud, but give grace to the humble. But he continues to pour out more and more grace upon us. For it says, God resists you when you are proud, but continue. You know what, Jeffrey? I want you to take this back to verse 1, because I don't think I had the verse thing right. Take me back to verse 1. What is the cause of your conflicts and quarrels with each other? Doesn't the battle begin inside of you as you fight to have your own way and fulfill your own desires? This already stings. Keep going, Jeffrey. You jealously want what others have, so you begin to see yourself as better than others. 
You scheme with envy and harm others. Wow. To satis to selfishly obtain what you crave. That's why you quarrel and fight. Wow. And all the time you don't obtain what you want because you won't ask God for it. And if you ask, you won't receive, for you're asking with corrupt motives and seeking only to fulfill your own selfish desires. Wow. <clears throat> you have become, oh, this is the one that hurts. You have become spiritual adulterers who are having an affair, an unholy relationship with the world. We cheat on God. Wow. Don't you know that flirting with the world I can't read that word. Huh? Values places. Flirting with the world's values places you at odds with God. Whoever chooses to be the world's friend makes himself God's enemy. Next. Does the scripture mean nothing to you that says the spirit that God breathed into our hearts is a jealous lover who yes. intensely desires to have more and more of us? Yes. But he continues to pour out more and more grace upon us. For it says God resists when you are proud. Oh, but continually pours out grace when you are humble. Yeah. So then, surrender to God, stand up to the devil. Oh, some of y'all need to hear that. And resist him, and he will turn away and run away from you. <clears throat> Move your heart closer and closer to God, and he will come even closer and closer to you. Notice how you're making the first move. Wow. But make sure you cleanse your life, you sinners, and keep your heart pure and stop doubting. Yeah. Ooh, you know, some, some preachers wouldn't even read this because they like, I don't want the people to feel like, man, I don't want them to feel this kind of way. I'm going to read this to you. Feel the pain of your sin. Be sorrowful and weep. Let your joking around be turned into mourning oh. and your joy into humiliation. Why in the world would the scriptures say that? Why would they say that? I'll tell you why. Because sometimes we think it's okay to sin a little bit. It's no big deal. And we joke around about it and we just keep on doing it. Go back to that scripture, Jeffrey. I, 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 that one's got something on me. But you know what God is saying? God is saying, no, I need you to feel some conviction in your life about some of the stuff that you're doing. Because if you don't ever feel conviction, then you'll never repent and we'll never get you to grow. And guess what? Whenever I... Stop joking around. Let it be turning to mourn a little bit. Feel some humiliation for what you're doing in your life, for the sins that you're committing, just living freely. I'm going to finish reading the scripture. Jeff, go ahead. <laughs> I'm getting ahead of my own self. Be willing to be made low. Wow. Wow. Man, that's a mic dropper there. That word after B. Some of the problem is we, we want to be elevated, but we don't want to be willing to be made low. Right. Like we don't want to get humiliated or broken for our sin, but we want to get elevated to the platform where we want what we want. Be willing to be made low before the Lord and he will exalt you next. I'm going to put this one in there. This is a bonus round. Dear friends, as part of God's family, this is a text straight from Jesus, bro. Never speak against another family member. For when you slander a brother or a sister, you violate 
God's law of love. Amen. And your duty is not to make yourself a judge above the law Amen. of love by saying that it does not apply to you, but your duty is to obey it. There is only one true lawgiver and judge. The one who has the power to save and destroy. So who do you think are to judge your neighbor? Listen to those. What is that word? Listen to those who are boasting today or tomorrow. We will go to another city and spend some time and go into the business and make heaps of profits. But you don't have a clue what to do, what tomorrow may bring, for your fleeting life is but a warm breath of air that is visible in the cold only for a minute and then vanishes. Instead, you should say our tomorrows are in the Lord's hands. Mm -hmm. And if he is willing, we will live life to its fullest and do this or that. One more, Jeffrey. Someone texted me this scripture this morning. Someone in this congregation said, I said, that's a good scripture. They actually texted me verse 18. I correct I believe it's only not 18 verses in that. I looked for an hour for the 18th verse we find about it. And I see, so that's what we've been talking about. I said, that's exactly what. That person did not know that a chain of events is going to happen today. And that Jeffrey, what's your hacking in the computer system? Shut that thing down. Oh, yeah. There you go. So, here it is. So, if you know of an opportunity to do the right thing today, Yet you refrain from doing it. You are guilty of sin. Wow. That's good stuff, man. That's... Take it back to verse 1 and let's pray. Lord, in Jesus' name, that you would anoint me, God, to, to carry your word. Do what you ask me to do tonight, Lord. You are good. We need your anointing. I need your anointing. I cannot teach something I haven't even read. Without your help, let us receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Receive it. Hey, you know, there is a, this, there's this thing that tries to emerge itself in some churches and some denominations and non-denominational churches, little ones, big ones, all of them. We're not immune to them. We're not immune to these things. But there's a, there's like a synthetic version of church that is like a, we take all the stuff that we, you know, if you could, let's just say this, if you could take all of the stuff you like about one thing and, and you could take out the stuff you like, you don't like about it. And then you can take all the stuff you like out of another thing and take everything you don't and put it all together and make something really good. And it's sometimes I think that we try to make a synthetic version of churches which where we take conviction and we take repentance and we take all of that out of the church. And we just try to make this fake thing in the church where there's no real feeling, no real strength of heart. This is what this church is about. I want to tell you what this church is about. This church is about the real thing. And sometimes humanity is messy. I said it. Sometimes family is messy. 
Sometimes uh, marriage is messy. Sometimes there's some bumps and some bruises and some things. Sometimes it's a struggle. Sometimes, guess what? And, and some people have said this. Oh, I, I, as soon as I went to church, I wasn't married three or four weeks, and I started having all kinds of problems. Yes, you will. You know why? Because the enemy doesn't want you here. So what he wants to do is he wants to stir up enough stuff in your life where you'll say, well, it didn't start happening until I went to church. You're right. You weren't an effect in anything. You weren't a threat of getting yourself into heaven until you showed up and started hearing God's word. So that's when the enemy said, well, I got to do something now. I didn't have to worry about it before. Authentic, oh, the authentic church is this. There's going to be warfare at times in your life. There's going to be attacks in your life. There's going to be things that try to get you down. There's going to be things that try to move you or shake you or get your faith to turn. I want to tell you this. The Bible said that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. It, you know, every preacher in the world has preached this message. It never said that the weapon wouldn't form. But it said it wouldn't prosper. I want to tell somebody tonight before we get started. Don't look at the weapon. It's going to form. Don't worry about what the devil is building over there to destroy you. Don't worry about what it looks like over there on the other side. He built a big old bazooka and he's like, I'm going to shoot you with it. And every day he works on it. He he oh, soon as I get this thing, I, one more time in your marriage, and I'm going to blow this thing up one more time in your finances and I'm going to destroy it. You can form it all you want. This word said it ain't going to prosper. Amen. I want to get into this Bible study now. And I want to say this. There's a young kid in this church. The family is new. His name is Bud. All right? Uncle Bud. I think that's a nickname. I'm pretty sure because he's way too young to be an uncle. He's probably that tall. <laughs> <laughs> little curly blonde headed kid. You've seen him running around the church. Sweet as he can be. Always got on cowboys. <clears throat> After Sunday's sermon, or the dad told me, said, let me tell you what he told me. He told me, Daddy, whenever you're drinking that beer, Jesus gets further and further away from you. Or you get further and further away from him. And when you quit drinking it, he got closer and closer and closer to you. And the little boy, I don't remember the exact story, but the end part of the story was this. And Jesus gives you a bunch of chances and he keeps coming back to check on you. He keeps coming back to see you. But he won't keep coming back forever. And the man said, the dad said, this has really happened. Who told you that, son? And he said, Jesus told me in my head to tell you. I don't want y'all to get that wrong idea. We are, there is no such thing as greasy grace. Right. Greasy grace is I can sin and then I can get in right. and wallow around in some greasy grace and everything's going to be all right. I'm going to tell you something. I don't believe that. I don't believe it with anything in me. Yes, I believe there's grace. No, I don't believe grace is extended to an unrepented, proud person. No, I don't believe that God died, shed blood, and was humiliated, and left the splendors of heaven, robed himself in flesh, went through all kinds of turmoil down here so that you and I could have a sin party and do whatever we wanted. And he said, you know what? Y'all go ahead and enjoy whatever you wanted. The check's on me. I've got it. No, I think God was saying, listen, I need you to try. I need you to stay close to me. What if not gospel, just Matt, just opinion. What if God only comes around? What if our God only comes in our situation so many times? I had someone tell me I feel like God has put me in a place that I'm struggling and striving to find me. 
And I said, God will never put you in that place. He said, no, you don't understand. He's delivered me so many times. And I went back so many times. There's a, there's a spot that we can get to that feels very cold in life. And I've been there before. And I want us to be aware of this. If there's things in your life that are wrong, give them to God. Amen. Let him work on them. Like while his grace is here, while his presence is here, while you're here, while you're feeling his spirit minister to you. Some people get mad at conviction. I get glad at conviction because I'm like, you know what? At least God is still here with me. And I'm still, he's still saying, son, get this right in your life. You know, it's it's like if I feel like if if I did do something and I didn't feel bad about it eventually, then I would start to be really, really, really worried because I was thinking, wait a minute, Dad's not watching no more. He doesn't care where I go. Maybe he's done said, you know what? I've been to your place four or five or ten or twenty or thirty or a thousand times, but you keep going back to the same old thing. So why don't you just let me know when you're finished doing whatever going to do and then I'll come. Oh, I want to preach this morning or this evening. I want to tell you that I believe we've got to stay in a place where God is filled. We feel that conviction. That The Bible says repentance is the key to life. So we're going to read. What is the cause of your conflicts and quarrels with each other? Doesn't the battle begin on the inside? Of you as you fight to have your own way and fulfill your own desire. Next. You jealously want what others have. So you begin to see yourself as better than others. What causes us to do that as Christians? Insecurity. Insecurity is the, oh, I'm, I'm getting too deep tonight. Insecurity is a thing that does not belong in God's people. And I'll tell you why. Everybody has their own type of calling. Everybody has their own, God has got a mantle on every person in this building to do something. And, and sometimes it seems like, because we wanted this person's mantle, or we wanted this person's job, or we wanted this person's income, or this person's wife, or this person's car, that we start getting selfish and letting pride build up. He said, you jealously want what others has, so you begin to see yourself better than others. You scheme with envy, and you harm others to selfishly obtain what you crave. We are ruthless in church sometimes. Christians can be some of the hungriest wolves there is. That's why you quarrel and fight among you. Maybe 2021's church is a church to see who can look the coolest and who can have the most. And all the time you don't obtain what you want because you want what you want, you ask God for it. Go ahead. You will not ask God for it. And if you ask, you won't receive it for your asking with corrupt motives, seeking only to fulfill. Just leave it there. Just leave that one there for a minute. Seeking only to fulfill your own selfish desires. What does that mean? If you ask, you will not receive it. Wait, I thought the Bible said, ask and you shall receive. Knock and it shall be opened. Seek it. I know it says that in your I can go find it. It said, ask and you shall receive. Wait a minute. What if God is reading your heart and not your words? What if when you're asking God for something, like he's not hearing a word you're saying, he's reading every emotion and motive that's coming out of your heart. And we're saying, well, God, why don't I have it yet? Maybe, well, God's not, I've heard him say, God, I'm not answering you. I'm asking him a hundred times. He ain't asking me no more. I don't want to do kicking rocks down the road. Maybe what your words are saying and what your heart is saying is two different things. So God's saying no 
in accordance to your heart, not your mouth. Seeking to only fulfill your own selfish desires is what I'm asking God for over and over. Is it something for self? Or is it kingdom related? I ain't saying you can't ask for that new bass boat, Oscar. <laughs> it's kingdom related. We're going to use it for the church. God grant it in Jesus' name. <laughs> Next. You have become spiritual adulterers, having an affair with an unholy relationship with the world. Wait, what? I want to tell you this. There's nothing that God detests more for his bride to be dating him, married to him, and dating the world. Oh, y'all didn't get that. There's nothing that God detests more than to have an uncommitted bride. We, we become that sometimes. When we partake in everything that this world has to offer that pleases our own flesh. I know pastors preaching on fresh air tonight, but that's okay. We'll get through it. Here's the deal. God said, I want a committed bride. I want a bride who's not sitting at the dinner table with me and I'm all in the world, but it's focused on me. Wow. That's intimately, when we go somewhere, her eyes don't gaze off to some other thing that this world has to offer, that it stays on me, that no matter how tempting, whatever it is that may pass by, her eyes never come off the cross of Calvary, that she doesn't waver, she doesn't falter, and it doesn't matter what happens or what comes the way, it doesn't matter what is put in front of her, it doesn't matter uh, what's strung on, how great it may look or how great it may sound, her eyes are only for me. I want to tell you something, church, God said the bride of Christ's eyes have to only be for him and that's it and if they're done and we're flirting with something outside of the world then we are guilty of the scripture of becoming spiritual adulterers is flirting with God's spirit and flirting with the world's spirit and seeing who's got the best thing to offer I think for what we're asking for as a church, as a people, that we have to be that committed. Well, I want to say this for a minute. You need to have as much commitment in your life as what you're asking for. Uh-oh. If you're asking for big things, you better have big commitment. If you're asking for big things, you better have big consecration. Oh, that word's for If you're asking for big things, you better have big faith. If you're asking for big, oh, if you're asking for big things, you better have a big prayer life. If you're asking for big things, you better have a big worship with you. If, I believe this. God will not bless us more than our character. Like we're saying, God, bring me this. God, let me do this. God, I want to do that. And then as soon as we say that, God puts us in a character test. And we're like, God, I thought you were going to give me all this. And God's like, I'm trying to give it to you, but first I got to get your character right because you can't handle what I really want to do in your life with that old character that you have because your character doesn't match my anointing. And the last thing I'm going to do is put you up here and put that man with that anointing on you and then you slide out of here and do the wrong thing and ruin your whole ministry and go, oh, somebody better listen to what I'm saying. You need to get the character to line up with the anointing. Don't you know that flirting with the world's values places you at odds with God? What's the world's values? Okay, I'm going to get in trouble in the TikTok world, but here I go. World's values. It's okay to be gay. It's okay for the preachers, churches to marry two people of the same sex. Oh. Thank God, I'm 
Okay, good. Well, the world's values. It's okay if you still drink and get drunk a little bit. It's okay. You can still be in the ministry. You can still be do whatever you want to do. This is a little beer. They drink wine in the Bible, remember? It's okay. The world's values. It's okay to not be modest anymore, females. It's okay. Men, it's okay to use whatever word you want to use. It's okay to listen to whatever music you want to listen to. It's okay to do anything that you oh the pastor's all awesome. in. I'm in the middle of people's lives right now, but I'm I'm gonna I'm be all right. It's gonna be okay. We're gonna get through this together. But listen, this is what's funny. If we accept those values and we start saying, well, the only way we really gonna be with the new 2021 is if we get with some of these values, Pastor, we negotiate some of these things and say, hey, what about this one? It's not that bad. And God is saying, man, you're cheating on me. Wow. Now, you told me that you would be holy for I am holy, for that's what I said. <laughs> if the word said, be ye holy for I am holy, you told me that you would be faithful. You told me, you, you said, if I walk with you, you'll walk with me. Yeah. And now the world comes by and offers you a little bit of advancement if you'll accept their values. Right. Come on. And now you become a spiritual adulterer and you can't understand why I've left and it's incomplete and my glory has departed. Wow. Ooh. I want to make sure that the only thing I got my eyes on is him. Amen. Amen. Hey, it, I, listen, it's hard. I mean, you got work, you got family, you got bills, you got stuff you want. You know, there's all kinds of things that can take your eyes off of him. But I can promise you this. It will refocus on him. I've never gotten a spot in my life where I had my focus right where God didn't bring what I needed. Not one day in my life, not one day, in, in, even in the worst day, if I kept my focus on Him, if I kept my faithfulness to Him, He showed up. Whoever chooses to be the world's friend, y'all, that's some serious stuff, makes himself God's enemy. The, one, the last thing I want to be is an enemy to the person, the only person that cared about me in the midst of the turmoil and the muck and the mire that he had to come get me out of. Because there wasn't nobody in that place but me and my demons that I had brought with me on my own invitation that I now realize. That's another sermon. And God showed up. And did see sometimes I, I gotta let people know you don't know how dark it was in the midnight when God came and got me. And, and that's sometimes why I get excited up here or why I praise a little different than anybody else because God when God came to get me, it was very, very dark. And had he not, and I know that there's some of you in this place that are the same way. If it if it wasn't meant for him showing up in a very dark time, in a very dark place in your life, that you wouldn't be here today. And that's why God is saying, Look, I need some people that are remember. Remember who came and got them when nobody else would. And that'll be the people that'll be faithful to me. I want to tell you something. The best thing about this place is this. Listen and TikTok it or Facebook it or wherever you want to put it on. Delivered addicts make the best praisers. Because they remember yeah. What it was like to really be bound to get up in the morning and something had you, you didn't have anything. To get up in the morning and know I got to lean on this because it's all I got. And something about the praise is different when a man gets to church and says, Ain't nothing got me but God. Ain't nothing got me but Him. Like, there ain't no way I'm not going to be faithful to the one that did that much for me, to the one that went through heaven to pray to come get me when society said, Don't go get him. He's 
worthless. We've already tried and God said, get out of our way. There's a praiser back there. There's a worshiper back there. And I think there's a person that can be faithful to my cause underneath all that. So he went past the world and its opinions and came and got you and me because he knew. You know why? I'm going to give you an example. You can mess with a lot of things. If you mess with my wife, well, we can get out in this road. And I'm going to tell you why. Not because I think she's beautiful. She may not be. I don't know. I think she's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in the whole wide world. When nobody else was there, she was. Her and God. My faithfulness to her now is because I'm like, you know what? That's a ride or die, one in a million. God is a ride or die, one in a million for you. He ain't never going to leave you. He's never going to not come get you wherever you are. He's never going to say, you know what? I'm done. He's always going to walk past the opinion of everybody else and everything else and say, you know what? You may see a washed up addict. You may see a washed up prostitute. You may see a washed up bum. But I see a faithful worshiper, God loving and God fearing person that I can use. I want you to know that that is the reason. God chose you. Next. Does the scripture mean nothing to you that says the spirit that God breathed into your heart is a jealous lover who intensely desires to have he said it twice more and more We have this problem sometimes. We don't give God enough for what he wants to do. We think, okay, God did this little thing, and that's it. And God said, wait, I want to do more for you. I got, there's more that I want to do. There's more anointing. There's more healing. There's more to the story of your life that I want to do. Next, Jeffrey. But it continues to pour out more and more grace. There's the two words again. Guess what? For it says, you want to find a good way to not be living in the grace of God? Be proud. Have pride. For it says, God resists you when you are proud, but continually. You know what that means? That means it don't stop. Continually is, a, is something that never quits. It just keeps on going. No matter what, it continually is going in the same way. And he's saying what God is saying. I am continually, nonstop, pouring out grace on those who have humility and have humbled themselves before God. Not those that are proud and think, oh, I got this. I know what I'm doing. But those that say, God, I need you. I'm struggling. Sometimes we, we get to church, we put on the, oh, I'm not struggling with anything, sister, brother, <coughs> face. But it's all good at my house, brother. Bob. Just walk the dogs, cook the meal, mow the car. Paid all the car notes early. But my wife and me read some things, grand ditty in my house. God is saying, no, I need you to. I need you to bear your pain. I need you to open up and let me in. Because if you don't, I can't fix it. And if you keep walking around with it, it's going to turn into resentment. And you're going to wind up being a synthetic version of a Christian and not an authentic version because you never went to the doctor correctly. Next. Next. Move your heart closer and closer to God, and he will come even closer and closer to you. You know who's going to make the first move? Me. Yes, he's God. He can make you do it, but he's not that kind of God. 
Like he gave us the greatest and the worst thing. Someone the other day said they were telling me about the gift that God gave them. And I was like, you know what? That's a very serious gift. That is a blessing and a curse. And they looked at me and a tear came in their eyes and said, why did you say that? I said, because this is the reason that it's a blessing. And this is the reason that it's going to be a curse in your life. Free will is a blessing and a curse. What do you mean, Pastor? It's a blessing because you get to choose this day who you will serve. And guess what? The angels in heaven, do you know why they repent, let the they dance and shout over one sinner that repents? Think about it. Because they're created to serve. The angels have no free will. They're created to serve. So when they look down here and they see you who have a choice to go bad or wrong and decide or go wrong or right, and you decide to go right, it's, in, it's intriguing to them. The one thing God gave us that eats us up is free will. He says, it's your choice. And then God sits and waits and hopes you make the right choice. Yeah. Even closer to you, but make sure you cleanse your life, you sinners, and keep your hearts pure and stop doubting. Wait, what? Is that word at the end? What is doubt? Unbelief. What does the Bible say about not having faith? What does the Bible say about faith? Huh? Faith without works is dead. I'm looking for another one. Very good. I'm looking for another one. Do you want to be pleasing to God? Of course you do. The answer is yes. The Bible says without faith it is impossible. He said, without faith, it is impossible to please him. Doubt is lack of faith. When you have doubt in your life about a situation, it's impossible for you to be pleasing God in that situation. Next, Jeffrey. Go to the last verse. Last verse. So if you know of an opportunity to do the right thing today, yet you refrain from doing it, you're guilty of sin. What does that mean? You're obedient. You're obedient. The Bible says to him, in this version, listen to this one. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. That kind of sheds some light on things because there may or not may or may not be some things in your life that you know you shouldn't do it and you're doing it anyway and the Bible's telling you clearly that's a sin and you're like it's not really a sin you know per se but I'm going to tell you what our free will uh, I call him Willie what he'll do he'll negotiate it with you and try to make me think well is it really a sin you know the devil when he came to Jesus, he said, if you really are the son of man, turn these breads into stone. And you try to negotiate and turn things around and tempt God. The enemy in your life would love to negotiate with you in your free will and tell you, eh, it's not really sin. And in your heart, you know that James 4 and 17 is telling you to him to know to do it right and does not it is sin. Let's stand. Raise your hands with me and close your eyes. I want to pray for everybody if you don't mind. God, we need to make sure that our heart, that our spiritual eyes are only on you. Yeah. That in no way has the world allured us to look elsewhere. That we have not become 
spiritual adulterers to you. That we are not using our freedom to negotiate to sin. That we are not tempted and swayed by the world's values. However convincing <clears throat> this world will spend billions and billions of dollars to convince you to desensitize to sin this year. Jesus in your name. Let us be certain, God. Let us start at the head. Let us start here and flow out into this crowd, God. Let us be certain of our calling. Let us be certain of our faithfulness to you. Let us be certain that our eyes are focused on you, God, and that we're loyal to you and that we're dedicated to you and that we're faithful to you, God. It doesn't mean that we have to be perfect. It just means that we have to be repentant. Yeah. Repentance is the key that if we walk around with this sin and continue to justify that that sin is okay, then that sin begins to take root and join us and abide in our life. And then it's so hard to get out because we don't even realize it's sin anymore. It's just something that we live with every day is something that we've become accustomed to. God, we need to break that mentality right now. Anything that's in our life that is sin, God, we need to get under the blood and be repented and get it out of our life. Because you are trying to progress families forward. You are trying to bring men and women forward. You are trying to bring people from one level to the next. And God, your word is telling me to tell the people it's time for the next step. Guess what? In the next step, something has to fall off your life right now. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's frustration. Maybe it's addiction. Maybe no telling what it may be. And nobody in this place has to know but you and God. But God is saying right now in order for you to make it to the next step, to elevate to the next point of your life, I need this to fall off of you tonight. I need you to be able to say, God, I don't want it anymore. I need to get rid of it. I need it to fall. Now, I got to a point where it's become so heavy that I can't even carry it. It was just this small thing, but I've entertained it so much that it's become this massive consumption of my life. Fall. Fall. Fall off. In the name of Jesus, release. Jesus. Some of you are carrying things that are driving you close to insanity. It's deep rooted. And God is saying, it's time for you to take the next step. And I want to get this out of your life. Will you release it? Listen, I feel the Holy Ghost saying, I'm not going to take it. They're going to have to release it. Once they release it, I'll handle it. But when you still got your hands on it, I'm not going to touch it. I've been telling you over and over again to release it. I'm telling you tonight, release it. Get rid of it. Say, I don't want it anymore. And let God handle it right now in this place. Jesus, in your name. I declare freedom to the captains. Good news. The gospel of power and freedom in this house. The ability to repent and let your blood flow on our life. But God, right now, there's people going to get loose in this place. Oh, Jesus.
I want to say this out of this for there's a difference between repentance and confession. Confession is telling God about it. Repentance is giving it to God and changing it. Yeah. Lord, in your name, we love you. We thank you tonight for your word, God. We thank you for your presence in this building right now. We give you all the glory and all the praise. In Jesus' name, let's give the Lord some praise. talked about this little youngster that's God is speaking to. He has to go to Houston tomorrow. They have found a heart learner. So Brother Goss is going to stand in his place. <clears throat> There's been several several healings in the Gossett household already. So we're going to claim another one. Lord, in Jesus' name, you took the stripes for our healing, God. You already took them. God, you are speaking through that young, young man.